Coming up on this episode of Linux for Everyone, my interview with Zorin OS co-founder Artyom Zorin goes way beyond talking about a Linux distribution. You'll find out what the team has planned to improve Linux desktop adoption for the average PC user, in schools, and in government, especially as the end of Windows 7 support inches closer. And surrounding that chat is an absolutely rocking song from the source, courtesy of Demonic Sweaters. Plus, the first of many community-submitted Linux origin stories, and a look at how Martin Wimpress and the Ubuntu Mate team are making version 19.10 something special. Episode 11 starts right now. Linux Gugachtine, Falsius Jock. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This is Linux for Everyone, a podcast about desktop Linux, open source software, and the community who is creating and enjoying it. So the discovery of the week for episode 11 isn't necessarily a discovery this time around. It's, it's more of a celebration. If you've been engrossed in the Linux community for any length of time and, and pay attention to kind of the, the headlines and social media, you're probably familiar with Martin Wimpress. He is the project lead for Ubuntu Mate, and though he works at Canonical, this is kind of his passion project. And the reason that I wanted to talk about Ubuntu Mate is I had a discussion with Martin earlier this week, and he gave me kind of a sneak peek into the release notes for Ubuntu Mate 19.10. Now I know, ordinarily, you know, <laughs> release notes, right? They're they're kind of sterile, they're kind of boring, Distributions like Elementary OS kind of shake up that formula a little bit, and they give you a lot of transparency into the entire development process. And they're very verbose, and they let you kind of uh, be a fly on the wall and learn about not just the decisions they made, but why those decisions were made. Martin and his team took a similar approach for the release notes on um, Ubuntu Mate 19.10. And you want to talk about opening a blog with brutal honesty. This is what he says, quote, I have not been completely happy with the quality of recent Ubuntu Mate releases. And then he goes on to call this a paper cut release, um, meaning that there were several minor issues in existing releases of Ubuntu Mate that he says by themselves, they're not deal breakers, but in aggregate, they're they're frustrating and spoil the experience. Now, I have a pretty extensive article at Forbes that you can check out, and I'll have that linked in the show notes for this episode. But the real reason that I am talking about this today is because there's sort of an undercurrent, a really wonderful story to this blog post that isn't necessarily about this laundry list of improvements. The real story is something that you've heard me say a lot. You've heard a lot of the uh, developers and community members who've been guests on this show say a lot. And that is that non-developers can really make an impact on open source software and on their favorite Linux distribution. So case in point, Martin calls out one key change in this development cycle that is different than many of the others. He added two additional developers and a greatly expanded uh, quality assurance team, which is made up of some very dedicated community members. So he contacted the most active people on Launchpad and the ISO QA tracker for Ubuntu Mate and asked if they'd like to join the team. And my understanding is that this has become a very well-oiled machine. The team reports into him regularly. They kind of identify the the real outstanding um, issues that need to be addressed. And then Martin has a lot more time to spend on the fixes and the improvements. And he says, quote, without doubt, this is our best release because of them. And it really demonstrates, he says, how a non-developer can make a big impact. Or in this case, several non-developers 
so I know that I um, I may sound like a broken record when I say this, but really, if you feel the the need, the urge, the desire to get involved with your favorite open source project, just reach out and ask them uh, what they need from you. You never know wh- how you can shape the future of this, you know, amazing software that you use on a daily basis. So anyway, uh, a big shout out to Martin Wimpress for having a chat with me on the side and kind of um, giving me the the backstory to this release. I, I think it will definitely be one to watch. And plus, if you really enjoy a good release notes blog, certainly go and check it out. I'll have the link to that as well in the show notes at linuxforeveryone.fireside.fm. Uh, there's an entire paragraph, for example, devoted to all these ways that the team reduced the size of the ISO to compensate for the addition of the proprietary NVIDIA graphics driver, which is something that's going to be landing on all versions, all flavors of Ubuntu 1910. There's just uh, there's a lot of you know notable improvements and way too much to talk about here. But I just I really enjoyed the way that he wrote it and the style and um, and all the credit that he gives to the community. And I hope that I really hope that that inspires other people who don't know how to code uh, to to reach out and lend a hand. Okay, next up, I want to sprint through some housekeeping because there's a fair bit of it. And then we're going to get right to the interview with Artyom Zorin. And I I really think you guys are going to love this. First and foremost, uh, this is a quick message for all, I don't know, 275 of you listening to the show from Ireland. If you remember Connor Murphy, he was my first guest on the show way back on, I believe it was episode two. And he runs the Dublin Linux community. And he wanted me to uh, pass on that... There's going to be a clear Linux project talk at the Dublin Linux community meetup on November 2nd, 2019. And their guest for this is going to be Rodrigo Chiosi. He's a uh, OS engineer from Intel, and he'll be giving a presentation at 3.30 p.m. on Saturday, the 2nd of November. And then he's going to open it up to questions from the community. And Connor does emphasize that afterwards, they will be, of course, going to the pub. If you want more details or if you want to sign up and show up, uh, you can search for the Dublin Linux user group on meetup.com. And the next bit of housekeeping is a special one to me. It is a brand new Patreon tier called A Song from the Source. Now, in case you're not aware, uh, I do have a Patreon for this show. For as little as $1 a month, you can be listed as an associate producer of the show on the website. And then also get a little bit of special flair on our Discord server. But for $4 a month, you can get early access to the show. You'll get it 24 hours before the rest of the world, and you'll get it in 320k audio. Now, the one I just introduced, I am I am uh, humbled and, and excited to say that there are only two spots left now. It started with three. But it's called uh, A Song from the Source. And what this is, is me creating an original song with lyrics for you or someone who's special to you. I'll record it on Linux. I'll play it on this show with a special dedication. And uh, after the production is finished, you'll get the final song in FLAC or WAV format. And uh, of course, you know, in the spirit of open source, all the song's project files will be added to the Linux for Everyone GitHub to allow you or anyone else to remix it. So if you want to learn more, head over to patreon.com slash Linux for everyone. And if you just want to keep up with me and all of the craziness that happens uh, with the community around this show, that, that's, a, that's a good crazy, by the way. You can join us on Mastodon, Facebook, Twitter, and Telegram by just searching for Linux, the number four, everyone. That is Linux, the number four, everyone. All right, housekeeping complete. Thank you for your patience. And now... It is time for the main event, and after I chat with Artyom, we're going to hear a Linux origin story and then a song from the source that I really cannot wait to talk about. So my very special guest on this episode is one of the co-founders of Zorin OS, Artyom Zorin. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Um, we've, been, we've been chatting back and forth via email for several months, and... So it's great to to finally connect with you and get some insight uh, into you know what Zorin OS is and 
and kind of how you got started in all this and how, uh, what are your, you know, and what your thoughts are about the, the Linux landscape in general. How did you get started with Linux? So it goes all the way back to the summer of 2008, where my brother and I, we were, we just had our first computer that we shared between ourselves. And, you know, we were really enthusiastic about customization and just generally uh, using it like really power user in that kind of a way. And this was still back when we were using Windows. And I remember we actually customized it to look like Mac and then um, made it so slow that it would take 10 minutes to boot up with Windows. <laughs> so yeah, we, we were really in on customization. And then we came across videos of Linux and specifically, you know, the customization aspects of it. Like, I don't know if you remember the days of Compiz where you'd have like the spinning desktop cube and Windows turning into fire when you close it. Very over the top stuff. Uh, but we thought that it was really neat. So we we gave it a try and we loved it from the very beginning. We tried Ubuntu 17.10, I think it was. Um, and we thought it was amazing, even beyond just the customization aspects. It really clicked with us when we saw that it was just so much faster than Windows. You know, it doesn't get viruses. It has so many other advantages over traditional operating systems like Windows and Mac. And we thought that this is something that everyone should have the chance to use. And there's so many advantages that, you know, this could be a really big step in how people use computers uh, in the future. But we then showed it to our dad, who was just a regular computer user. He was a translator. And it became clear to us that Linux had a very big shortcoming in the form of its lack of ease of use especially back in those days, it was a bit more kind of designed for engineers by engineers. Mm, And, you know, to my brother and I, we thought that it was great. We loved using it every day. Uh, But the fact that there were some parts of it that were difficult to learn, uh, the fact that even, you know, some things were not in the right places, that the start menu wasn't there, the taskbar wasn't there, and that someone would have to learn an entirely new system just to be able to use their computer, um, we saw that as a really big roadblock to making Linux really ready for the general public. And at around the same time, there was a a school science fair, a national science fair that was coming up. And we happened to still be in school. Like I was 12, my brother was 13 at the time. Uh, And we thought that, hey, this Linux thing is really cool. Let's do something about that and maybe try and fix that issue and make Linux really user-friendly. So we came up with the idea of making it, you know, very familiar. So if someone who is using Windows can make the switch over to it really simply, that they didn't have to learn anything new, that would be a really great starting point in making Linux accessible for the general public. Um, Over the course of around nine months, we were developing the first version of Zornos, and then we eventually released it on the 1st of July, 2009. I remember the date. And the feedback that we got was really incredible like people really clicked with the system and you know we thought that we should really focus on this not just as the science project for the science fair but uh as a community project and we wanted to give back to the linux community that way so that's that's how the zornos project started i know this is digging back uh several years to into your memory but do you happen to remember where specifically that feedback was coming from was it you know, was it from existing Ubuntu users who, who saw something really exciting in what you guys were, were doing? Or uh, well, I guess what I'm asking is what, what specifically was that feedback like? Were there people drawing comparisons to existing distros they were using already? Yeah, I actually do remember pretty well. Um, when we first released the system, not many people knew about it. So we went around and uh, went onto like Linux forums and websites like that telling people you know hey we made this new system we think it's you know really user friendly for new users and we got a lot of different feedback from all sorts of different people some people have been using linux for ages some people have been dabbling in and out of it and they were saying that you know up until this point i kind of found linux to have a lot of roadblocks in the way where they would try to to use it for a while and they'd hit something that make it very difficult for them to continue using it. 
And just the user interface that is in Zorn OS made it really simple to get over those barriers and let them use Linux full time. And then some other users were more um, Linux enthusiasts, you know, the Arch users who uh, are pretty happy to <laughs> where, where they are right now, but they were telling their friends who weren't as Linux savvy as they were about our system and uh, showing them that and it really clicked with them. So they were really thankful that the system was really user friendly and that they were able to switch the friends over to Linux uh, and get them to understand what's so good about Linux, of course. So we had a lot of different feedback in the early days and it really shaped as to where the project would be going. So we're thankful for that. Now, I want to point out to our listeners that if I'm not mistaken, RTM, you were, you and your brother were in your teens mm -hmm. when you developed the first version of Zorin OS, correct? Yeah. And you did that in nine months? Yeah. I mean, the first version was quite rudimentary. We were just learning how everything works in Linux. So uh, beyond just the user interface uh, by default, there weren't an awful lot of changes between it and Ubuntu, you know, but we learned more and more every day about using Linux as well as programming because we hadn't really learned about programming up until that point. Um, so yeah, we were just rapidly iterating after that point, making new versions and um, shipping new features. And, you know, we were really enjoying it even just as a, as a hobby and a side project of ours. I just have to say that one of the, one of the pieces of messaging that has always resonated with me about Zorin OS is the line, a powerful desktop you already know how to use. And so, so listening to your, your origin story here, it sounds like you had that in mind from the very beginning, and that is just such a perfectly crafted statement. Yeah, thanks. No, uh, over the past few years, you know, we've been learning a lot more about not just the technical aspects, but also the more um, human-centric aspects, uh, just how we communicate, you know, what's the value proposition, essentially, if you want to use business speak, of something like Zorn or something like Linux. And it has taken us many years to figure out how to communicate, you know, Linux to the general public in, in a way that's very succinct. So um, thanks for the feedback. Like, um, it, it's, it's good to hear that what we're doing is, is going to use. So thanks. So at what point did you and your brother decide to turn this into a full-time pursuit or, or something that would be a business for you down the road? Yeah, so I think it was after the second or third version, we saw that there were users who wanted not just the bare bones of the traditional operating system that comes with, you know, the standard office suite, music player, and, and, and the bare essentials. We also saw that there were more power users that uh, wanted you know, video editing software, 3D modeling software, you know, tons of games pre-installed. Uh, and we thought that, you know, we really loved doing Zornos, but we do want to make it more sustainable over the long term. And, you know, putting two and two together, um, why not release a version of Zornos with all those extra features um, that also help the community to, to give back to the project? Uh, and also add in some technical support into there because, you know, we were seeing that some people needed a bit of help with setting up the operating system, setting up Linux on the computer. Um, so if we put all of that into a paid for package that would, you know, help the project to, to grow beyond what it is right now, um, that that would make it much more approachable, not only for the paying customers, but also just for everyone. We're able to dedicate more time to the operating system, developing it, maintaining it. Um, so it was around version two or three, I think, that we started shipping the Ultimate Edition. But as to full-time work, I was actually only around three and a half years ago. My brother finished college. He graduated. I decided to uh, stop out of college after third year to, to focus on Zornos. And being able to focus full-time on a project makes a world of difference, I have to admit. And uh, just as a message to, to all the users of not just Zorin OS, but open source and Linux software in general, being able to support a project so that, you know, there are people working full time on it really does increase the quality and the amount of thought that goes into making that uh, software. 
And I would have to imagine that it, it also benefits the, the larger Linux community as well, right? Because you're not only polishing your own product and, and delivering a better user experience, but I'm sure that a lot of your work goes upstream as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's what's so great about open source software. You know, contributions go downstream as well as upstream. And uh, we were really excited to see that when we made the switch over to GNOME Shell Desktop back with Zornos 12, um, there were some challenges that needed to be overcome to make the system a lot more user-friendly into what we would consider ready for the next version of Zornos. So we developed uh, a few desktop extensions like the Start Menu and uh, Zorin Taskbar. And we were really excited to see that other projects were forking it and, and using the code that we wrote. Uh, for example, Dash to Panel, that's, that's based on Zorin Taskbar. Arc Menu is based on our... Oh, I didn't know uh, that. I use that menu. all the time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, we're really thankful for that because the contributions for the Dash to Panel and, and our Arc Menu projects go back into Zornos as well. So it's kind of a cyclical commit stream, you can say. Um, which is only possible in Linux and open source software. So that's really cool to see. So was there some initial, well, let me, let me rephrase this. When you first announced and launched the Ultimate Edition, did you guys get a lot of blowback just at the, at the idea of, of charging for a Linux distribution? Yeah, of course. There are some people who um, were a bit apprehensive about, you know, a paid for a Linux product. Like we just want to reiterate at the moment that we're always going to have the free editions of Zorin OS. And honestly, we probably wouldn't have switched to Linux ourselves if it wasn't, if it didn't have such low barriers. Of course, you know, we were school kids. We didn't have a stream of income ourselves. So um, we always will have a free edition of Zorin OS, but there were people who thought that what made Linux Linux is purely the fact that it's free is in price. And I understand those people, but I think it's a lot bigger than just that. Linux has so many advantages that go beyond just the software itself. It's also the community aspect um, and having it developed by so many people that there are costs associated with that time as well as servers, you know, keeping that up and running. Uh, And we do try to communicate as much as possible that you know, the contributions that you can choose to make to not only Zornos, but Linux projects in general, go back into making the overall product better for everyone. And it's thanks to these patrons that, you know, Linux has got to this stage. Um, It doesn't happen. uh, This kind of work doesn't happen in a vacuum. Developers do need to put food on the table in order to focus full time on, on the products. Yeah, and I've seen I've seen so many examples of either um, you know quality Linux distributions going away because of lack of income, or mm-hmm. developers uh, you know kind of turning a one hundred and eighty and saying, "Well, look, this." Uh, I think Uku is a great example that that nice GUI uh, Linux kernel mm-hmm. updater, you know, where he said, "Hey, this isn't free anymore because despite having six thousand downloads a month i had like you know three or four people donating money to it so i've got to charge money for it now so that i can make my time worthwhile and make a you know make a better product yeah absolutely and a lot of the time uh the products the the open source linux based software products that uh do choose to to make them paid for they end up you know saving time of the users as well that is worth money and in a lot of cases it's even more valuable, you know, paying for that piece of software and, um, you know, saving the time with, in the case of Uku, installing the kernel updates really simply. Um, so there's a lot more depth to um, paid for products like that, that uh, would make sense to be considered as a user. And perhaps it is also a challenge of, uh, the maintainers of those those products to really communicate that aspect to it that there is this value exchange going on. Yeah, de- absolutely. So, who would you consider your target audience for Zorin OS? Yeah, so from day one, it's always been about trying to make Linux in general more accessible. So, people who haven't had the chance to to use Linux before to take advantage of all of its features and and what makes it great. And every decision that we make 
has been centered around that user group. Uh, and we're really thankful to see that it's not just those user groups, you know, those new users that are using Zornus. It's also, you know, Linux users at large that have been using Linux for, for years. But our goal has always been to, to grow the pie of what, to, to grow the user base of Linux on the desktop. And so making the system not only, you know, more user friendly from a technical aspect, but also just the general user experience. How do you go about getting the system onto your computer? Is that through a download with a USB drive or is it a pre-installed um, you know, laptop with, with our system on it? Uh, these are all the kinds of questions that we ask because we're focused on that user group of all those new people switching over. People who uh, not specifically want to use a computer for the sake of using a computer, but also just to get work done for themselves. Right. And there's, there's a lot of diversity in the kinds of, of users that we um, take into account when we're making decisions about changes in ZornOS. Well, speaking of, you know, having Linux pre-installed on, uh, on PCs, <laughs> I have to mm. congratulate you on the, the partnership with Star Labs. So Star Labs is a UK-based uh, PC manufacturer, specifically laptops. And they, they obviously have a Linux-centric focus and uh, I actually have one of I have their laptop Mark II, and it's it's incredible for the price, and it it's it's something that I would actually compare to an XPS thirteen. Uh, in fact, I, I ran some benchmarks against the XPS thirteen because they have identical hardware across the board, except for the the screen and the resolution. But the the Star laptop actually came out ahead of the XPS thirteen. And I think shortly after I, I ran those benchmarks and, and published those findings, you guys announced a partnership with Star Labs that they would be selling, uh, or they would be they would be offering the option of Zorin OS as a as a pre-installed Linux distro. So how how did that come about, and was it was it the first type of partnership that you've had in in that way? Yeah, so it actually started off uh, quite a while before uh, that announcement. Uh, I, I remember Star Labs approached us and sent us an email saying that, you know, we got interest for people who want ZornOS on our, our laptops and we'd love to work with you. And uh, we thought that was really exciting because we saw that one of the main barriers of Linux is just the installation aspect. So um, power users generally are able to get through the installation process pretty easily. But say, um, you know, regular computer users, they'd feel intimidated by that. and by shipping computers with Zornos pre-installed, um, that could lead into a whole new class of users coming into the operating system and, and trying out Linux for the first time. So we we were really excited about the opportunity, and um, especially with the work that we were doing with Zornos 15 ahead of the launch, we thought that it would be a perfect fit for their hardware. And so just after the release of Zornos 15, a couple of weeks, I think, afterwards, um, we decided to, to launch the, the product on both of our websites. And, you know, it's been really exciting so far. And we want to collaborate with even more manufacturers and even more countries to make it even more accessible to have preloaded Linux laptops. Well, best of luck on that. And, and I hope, can you give us a clue? Yeah, we're, we're working with a couple of manufacturers uh, at the moment. Uh, one of them is an Italian-based one, and without nice. hinting too much uh, in the roadmap, it is a, a touch-based device. Oh, that's exciting. Nice. Yeah, so that was, that was one of the motivations for the new touch-based layout in Zornos okay. 15. So, so we thought the timing was right to come out with it with the new release. Yeah, you know, there's not, um, there's, in my experience anyway, there are not many... Linux distributions or or desktop environments even that um, are suitable for you know two in one type devices where they're those convertible laptops. So it's nice to see uh, touch interface you know and touch functionality getting getting uh, front and center. Yeah, no, we were really excited by switching over to, to GNOME Shell a couple of years ago. Uh, we just thought that they were so far ahead of you know other desktop environments in supporting, you know, a whole range of hardware, uh, not only touch-based devices, but also high DPI resolution uh, screens, um, 
fingerprint readers, all sorts of devices like that. And we thought that the user experience that we could deliver with GNOME Shell was going to be much better. And we're so happy that we made the switch over to GNOME Shell as well. So going back to, you know, going back to the idea of Linux adoption and and seeing uh, Linux distributions being a pre-installed option with uh, OEMs, I have a question from one of our listeners, Alex. And mm-hmm. he asks, with the fallout of what happened with Huawei, causing other countries to look into Linux more, and some even developing RISC-V or ARM-based products, what is your take now on the future of Linux adoption? Do you, and, and more specifically, at least from, from my point of view, do you think that Huawei offering Deepin on their laptops will maybe start some kind of sea change in terms of how people view the modern Linux desktop. Yeah, absolutely. I think the year ahead that is that is coming, um, starting in January, of course, is going to be really exciting because in January, Windows 7 is going to lose support and 30% of all computers are still using Windows 7. And they're going to have to, f- the users are going to have to find um, some sort of alternative, either buying new computers, uh, even if the computers are currently working fine with Windows 7 or switching over to something like Linux. I think that a bunch of developments like that, like the Huawei affair, like RISC-V in the future as well, it is going to make Linux a lot more uh, viable in a lot more use cases than it has ever been before on the desktop. And I think this new exposure that people will have to Linux um, will make them see that you know, what they previously saw as Linux as, you know, the terminal command line, very difficult to use uh, operating system. You know, it has developed so much over the past 10 years. Uh, even ourselves, like at, at, at Zorn OS, we think that especially this year in 2019, Linux has developed to a stage where we believe that it is finally ready for the general public to make the switch over to for the majority of users. You know, LibreOffice has gotten so good um, Wine has gotten so much more compatible with Windows apps if people need to use them. Also, take into account more apps are moving towards cloud-based offerings, so through the web browser, which makes them a lot more cross-platform compatible, which makes the app gap problem, which previously stopped a lot of people switching over to Linux, it makes that app gap less of a problem. Um, things are just a lot more cross-platform right now. More people are making Linux apps and games. So when people start to see that, um, hey, there's this other system out there, Linux, and they use it, they experience it, they can see that I'm actually able to get everything that I wanted to, you know, get done with my computer done on this platform. And it's, you know, resistant to viruses, and it's faster, and it doesn't get slow over time. Um, I think it will be really exciting to see that. Now, a few months ago, when I spoke to you last about Zorin OS 15, you mentioned that you and your brother have some plans to expand the team, and that is specifically tied to that Windows 7 support ending in January. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and what you guys are doing there? Yeah, so beyond just the operating system itself, we're working on a new project, which we hope to have out at the beginning of next year to coincide with the Windows 7 end of support period. So we've actually seen that it is now uh, come to a stage where Linux is ready for a lot of organizations, businesses, and and, and schools, for example, to make the switch over to it. So if I can rewind back to 2016, there was a city in Italy called Vicenza, uh, just a couple of kilometers west of Venice. And uh, they were faced with the problem of Windows XP losing support. So they've been paying Microsoft for the extended support for Windows XP, but they had around like 700 computers that were still running it across the city. And they were looking for an alternative to having to buy a whole load of new computers just for Windows 10. And they came across ZornOS because there was a, a school in the area that made the switch over from Windows XP to ZornOS. And it really clicked with them that it could solve their issue that they're facing right now with you know, the lack of funding to buy a whole load of new computers, but also the advantages that Linux has in general with the security aspect. And also they found the open source um, philosophy of Linux very attractive. 
And when they came across Zornos, they saw that it was user friendly enough for them to make the the rollout on all of the computers in the municipality. So um, a couple of weeks later, they actually made the announcement that they were going to pilot Zornos on on installing them on municipality computers. Uh, funnily enough, we had only found out about it a couple of weeks before they were going to to make the switch over. Uh, so it was a very informal affair and. We were actually really surprised at how smooth the transition was. Um, you know, they asked us a couple of questions about some apps that they wanted to get working on the computers. Fairly simple support requests. Since then, they've been really happy with the switchover. I remember there was an Aus- Austrian newspaper that did a piece about them a year later, and they were, you know, really happy with the switchover. Even though, you know, a lot of their users, in, in fact, on average, they're users um, in the municipality, they were um, uh, on the average of 50 years old, which would make it more difficult to make the switch over to to a new system. But they found it really simple and smooth to make that that change over. And they've been really happy with the results of the switch over. But the one issue that they did have was being able to manage all the computers and and deploy Zornos on all the computers um, quickly and easily enough. So they would have to go out to, to each computer manually, stick the USB stick in, make the installation, install the apps they needed to install for that user, you know, manage updates, you know, in person. Which is incredibly time consuming. Yeah, yeah. So the rollout did take a lot longer than they expected, but that gave us the idea, what if we could make a, a software as a service tool that would connect to all the computers in their organization and allow the, the IT managers to... Um, manage all the computers centrally and really simply. And we thought that that is one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle that would make it possible for a lot of organizations to make the switch over to Linux. Uh, And so we're currently working on this new tool and want to get it out before uh, Windows 7 loses support so that organizations will see Linux as a really viable option. And over time, we want to support not just Zornos, but other Linux distributions like Ubuntu, uh, Pop! OS Elementary. So all sorts oh, wow. of different user groups you know, would be able to, to make the switch over to, uh, to Linux really simply and, and manage all the computers centrally. So I'm assuming that this same tool you're developing can also be used to deploy Zorin OS in schools. And you guys just released the Zorin OS Education Edition. In speaking with you, I, I can understand what drove you to create an education edition. Uh, but what I'm really curious about is, is what are the biggest hurdles for Linux adoption in the school systems? Yeah, so we've been doing the, the education edition for, I believe, the past six or seven years. And we've gotten a bunch of feedback over the years about, you know, where it succeeded, where there were some shortcomings. And over time, as more software more education software became cross-platform, those hurdles have really fallen down a lot. And it's come to a point where for a lot of schools, for a lot of educational institutions, Linux is getting to a stage where it is a viable option. A lot of the you know, pushback that currently is you know, in place in, in, in schools uh, is about just the ease of use of Linux. And that's where, you know, we've been focusing a lot on the educational edition to show that, you know, all the educational software that's available for Linux coupled with a really user-friendly interface would make the switch over really simple. And, you know, we, we have heard a lot of success stories of, of switching over to, to Zorn OS education in schools. And we think that the two main issues at the moment is being able to centrally manage those uh, computers in schools, uh, especially for larger schools and even universities, uh, that is still a challenge that we hope to address with the new tool. Uh, and the other issue is just generally letting people know about the stage of Linux uh, is at right now. Because when I'm talking to, to people that I just met about uh, you know what we do and w- about Linux, they generally picture Linux in their head as you know the terminal command prompt. Um, you know, very geeky uh, interface that is very difficult to use. And just getting the message out there that Linux has really matured to a stage where it is really user-friendly could make a huge difference 
in not only making the switch over for schools, but all sorts of different kinds of users. So it's those two hurdles that are currently in place. But especially as Windows 7 is losing support, a lot of schools are going to look at what's around beyond just having to buy new computers, especially with schools being uh, having less funding than they would like to have. Uh, I think Linux could be a really attractive mm. option there. So certainly 2020 is the year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, it's, yeah, it's I had to be said. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that, you know, I see that every single day in, in just my interactions with uh, the community on Twitter and, you know, my articles that I write at Forbes, overcoming that stigma of, of you know, oh, Linux doesn't have any hardware support. Linux, you have to use the terminal. It's ugly. People are, so many people are still stuck with this decade old impression of what Linux is. And mm -hmm. it, I, I, you know, sometimes I just find myself wishing there was some central way, you know, this just, I don't know, one website or one campaign that would speak for all modern Linux desktop distributions to like point people there or something. I don't know, because we're all having these conversations, but it's not a very, it's not focused and it's not a, a globally community driven thing. Yeah, I, I think it's predominantly a marketing problem in whatever way you, you picture the term marketing, but getting that stigma out of users, potential users, is one of the main hurdles I see to making the switch over to Linux on a big scale. It would be nice if there was one simple solution to this, but I think it is a case where we just have to talk to, to different people about you know the advantages that Linux has, how easy it is to make the switch over now that it has matured so much, especially over the past 10 years. Um, it's, it's matured a lot. And I think taking these baby steps one at a time is the key to addressing this problem at large and also making you know, Linux a lot more accessible uh, at every step of the user experience journey. Those two aspects, I think, will make it a huge difference in, in getting new users to, to Linux. And um, there are the, the computer manufacturers that are shipping Linux now uh, at a much larger scale than they ever had before. Uh, but also one of the main avenues that I see Linux growing a lot is in uh, organizations in enterprise settings where um, the IT people can, you know, install uh, Linux on the computers so that the users don't have to. And all the users have to do is just use the system as they would Windows, obviously with the advantages of Linux. And that's, that's where I see a huge amount of growth coming to Linux user base over the next couple of years. And that's why we're so excited about this new management tool that we're developing. And um, I think more efforts like that from across the community, across the different companies that are uh, working on Linux-based offerings, to get them to focus on the desktop, which has previously been kind of elusive as a, as, a, as a way of getting new users, but now I think is more viable. To get this kind of central effort together, I think will make a really big difference um, in making that switch over to Linux happen on a big scale. Switching gears just a little bit, um, I, I don't recall where I saw this, but I know that you have some very forward-thinking ideas about the kind of content that, that should be included on an operating system. And, you know, that goes beyond um, the, the open source software that you guys bundle with the education edition and in Zorin OS. Stuff like Wikipedia, right on mm -hmm. your operating system? Yeah, so this is an idea that we've been thinking a lot over the past year or two um, to think beyond just switching over, you know, Windows users to Linux, but also thinking about the next few billion computer users. So most of the world doesn't have a computer at home. They, um, they're making the switch over to smartphones from, from feature phones, but actually a full computing experience where they can, you know, manipulate data, they can uh, do productive tasks rather than consuming information that is a switch over that with the advantages that linux has and also the um, affordability of single board computers now like the raspberry pi and, and competitors to that taking those really low price points as well as 
all the features that Linux has uh, can make a computing experience, a full featured one available to a lot more people. Um, and we were thinking about this problem of how can we get more people using computers and Linux, of course, in emerging markets where there isn't really great access to internet. It might come you know, during the night, they might have more affordable internet overnight uh, with mobile networks. Limited internet connection is pretty much a constant in those potential user groups. So if we were to preload um, content like Wikipedia, Khan Academy, bunch of software for productivity and education as well, we think that it could make a very big difference in, in the developing world, not only you know having more people using Linux, but also having the power of these computing capabilities, as well as the knowledge preloaded on the computer, could help people really change their lives as well. Because in places where there isn't uh, wide access to education, perhaps an affordable PC can really help people uh, and, and communities over there to really thrive. So that's, that's where the idea came from. And it is a long-term goal of ours to develop not just the software, uh, like a, a special edition of Zornos for these single board computers in emerging markets, but also to potentially collaborate with hardware manufacturers, people who are making those single board computers and making a really polished end user product. Oh, that's really exciting. I, I guess you, you sort of answered my next question about a potential Zorin OS version for the Raspberry Pi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a really exciting hardware category that we've been looking at for quite a while. Um, but it is something that we need a few more resources to be able to develop and maintain. What, what kind so of resources? Hope, is, it, is it something the community could help with? Yeah, I, I believe like being able to, you know, get the word out about uh, Linux in general and having more people developing for Linux uh, and also generally in the most pragmatic sense, like developing hardware drivers for these single board computers uh, and having more uh, people contributing to, to code that help support those single board computer hardware in Linux would definitely help. Uh, but I think the path that we will be taking to support that new effort in the long term would be to use the revenue that we'd be making with that uh, enterprise management tool and reinvest it back into developing the operating system as well as uh, potentially hardware products for emerging markets and uh, putting all those pieces together. I I think we can really uh, collaborate with the Linux community at large. Well, it sounds like you have a a much more long-term and and ambitious roadmap planned out than I had previously thought. And I wish you guys nothing but success there. In in the shorter term, is there anything specific that that Zorin OS fans and um, you know the Linux community in general can do to help you achieve these goals? I mean, I what something I always tell people is you don't have to be a developer, you don't have to know code to give back to your favorite projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think especially at this point in time, what would make a huge impact is just generally telling the people that you know uh, about Linux and the stage where it is right now, where it is user-friendly and viable as an option for general computing. Because especially now as Windows 7 is losing support, a lot of people will be looking for these kinds of alternatives and telling uh, you know your friends about Linux not just about Zornos, but all sorts of different Linux distributions and projects and telling them how simple it is to make the switch over, that would bring so many more new people to Linux, so many more ideas, so many more uh, developers as well, let's face it, to Linux and generally make Linux a more vibrant uh, community than it already is and uh, make it more widespread, which I think benefits us all. And before I let you go, as, a, as someone who's trying very hard to switch to XFCE, I know that uh, Zorin OS 15 Lite is coming mm-hmm. soon. Can you give us any, any glimpse into uh, what you guys have done to 
to customize XFCE and what kind of hardware that might run on? Yeah, so Zarnos Lite, we're currently developing it. We hope to have it out before the end of the year. And our focus with it is to bring all that we've learned from developing Zornos on GNOME, bring all of the polish and user friendliness over to XFCE so that it can run on uh, computers with lower specifications, older computers. And we think that will make it a really attractive choice for people who have an old computer lying around that they can repurpose if it's running just fine. They don't have to buy a whole new computer just because, you know, like Windows is losing support. Our focus has really been on, on making a polished user experience and making it look very attractive and, and, and pretty because that makes a gigantic difference in making people's perceptions of Linux, you know, better and more accurate. Nice. I'm excited about this personally because one of the things that I've noticed is when you, uh, when someone with a much older computer, you know, with maybe just a, a dual core processor and two gigs of RAM or four gigs of RAM and a small hard drive, when they ask, you know, I want to get into Linux, what distribution should I use for this old laptop of mine? So many people in the community, I mean, bless their hearts because they're they're doing a good thing, but you know, they're pointing them to distributions that just they just don't look good. They're great in their functionality and their purpose, but out of the box, they just don't make that really nice, um, attractive first impression. And there's very few uh, Linux distributions that feature XFCE that look great out of the box. So my fingers are crossed for this one. Yeah, we've always thought that uh, aesthetics is an aspect of Linux that hasn't had as much focus as I think it ought to have. When you're talking to people who are potentially going to switch over to Linux, um, you don't want to just talk about the practical aspects that is faster, it doesn't get viruses, but you also want them to want to use Linux rather than think they have a need to. That would make them a lot more enthusiastic about making the switch over and potentially making them tell their friends about Linux. Just generally, uh, improving the user experience at large. Uh, so we've always thought of aesthetics as a pretty important aspect of, of what we're developing. Well, RTM, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, to share before before we say goodbye? Honestly, we, we covered a lot of topics We here. did cover quite a bit. Quite a lot, yeah. So I don't want to overload anyone else. So if you haven't heard of it before, or if you haven't seen it, it is ZoranOS.com, and you can get uh, ZoranOS 15, Zorin OS 15 Ultimate and Zorin OS Education, all at ZoranOS.com. It really is a beautiful distro and it looks fantastic on that first boot. And you, I think you guys have done a, a spectacular job making um, Linux more appealing to the mainstream. I wish you guys all the best and uh, keep at it and keep us posted. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show. It was, it was great to chat to you. Thanks so much. So this show is now part of the Destination Linux Network. And one of the really cool bonuses about the network itself is a community forum that gathers all of our collected communities into one place uh, just to chat about whatever, desktop Linux, gaming. Uh, you can get help over there. You can tell your story. And one of the stories that was told came from GW, and this is his Linux origin story. It was around 2003 I was very interested in learning the ins and outs of the Microsoft Xbox and discovered a distro called Gentoo X. I didn't really do much with it at the time, as even back then there wasn't a whole lot you could do on the desktop front with a 700 megahertz Celeron and 64 megabytes of RAM. The next year, Unreal Tournament 2004 came out with a Linux installer on the disk. That motivated me to try out a few other distros like SUSE and Mandrake, and later that year, Ubuntu had its first release, which I stuck with for several years. I also set up Gen2X on the Xbox again to act as a dedicated FTP server for all of my high school assignments. I've used Linux off and on over the years, usually in a dual boot configuration. I'd spend three to six months with Windows, get irritated by something and switch to Linux, and vice versa. But when Valve released Proton last year, I haven't touched Windows since. And there are about, uh, I think at last count, 40 or so cool origin stories like this. You can find them at discourse.destinationlinux.network. 
Well, it is almost time to say goodbye, but not before I bring you another song from the source. And this might be the most rocking one that I've played on the show. And I am so grateful to, um, I think it is Anarcho in the Linux for Everyone Telegram group introduced me to Demonic Sweaters. Demonic Sweaters also goes by the name Justin, and he has a YouTube channel of the same name. And uh, this guy is a multi-instrumentalist. He is exceptionally talented and uh, honestly, a man who is ridiculously prolific when it comes to writing and producing music and publishing it and talking about it because he has his own podcast as well. Oh, and as if all that wasn't enough, he has his own record label called Ant Hill Recordings. Now, he doesn't produce 100% of his music on Linux and FOSS, but I would say easily the majority of it is produced on Linux and FOSS. And what's really cool is he has extensive liner notes on archive.org where he details exactly which songs were recorded on which systems. And I would say about 90% of this album, which is called Polybius, was recorded on Ubuntu either 12.04 or 16.04. In fact, he has a few tracks on this album that were recorded using just a 2012 Samsung Chromebook, which was running uh, Ubuntu 12.04 with IceWM desktop environment and Ardor 2. All right, but let me tell you about this track. It's called Helicopter Cop. It was released in 2017, And it features Justin, a.k.a. Demonic Sweaters, on live drums. And the video that accompanies this, if you you like bands like Tool and you like really odd but powerful time signatures, um, you you should basically just go download all of this guy's music. Anyway, this is called Helicopter Cop. The band is Demonic Sweaters. This has been Linux for Everyone, episode 11. And until we meet again... Take care, and take care of each other.